Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Game Dev London podcast. Today I, I, I am Adam and I will be your host and you can refer to me as he him and with me today is Greg also he him. Hi Greg how are you doing today? Yeah not too bad uh, as I was just saying beforehand I'm very pleased or hopeful that the pandemic will end soon because currently the highlight of my life is going to big Tesco's and oh. sort of walking around aimlessly. <laughs> <laughs> we actually we actually had a shop we had a little open in our local area during the pandemic and I, oh, wow. I i went once and i stood outside and it was so it was so full of people i was like you know what i i'll come back later i'll come back yeah, yeah. <laughs> post all this when you are killed because it's the kind of place where i, I want to go and i want to get all the fancy bread and i, and I want to eat all that but i don't want to go when it's full of people um <laughs> it's on the list i find it's very hit and miss little in terms of like there's some amazing stuff there like the bakery section is very nice um but then you sort of roll the dice with the kind of the knockoff <laughs> brands of, like some of them are really nice but like for example their their fake pringles and their fake twixes are terrible but they they have a lot of good good uh, kind of things that have very similar labels to mainstream products you get that with quite a lot of places where you sort of you have to you have to figure out the the thing that they do best um like mm. i like the the fake twixies that you get in uh aldi i really like um because they are just you know, biscuit caramel and, and chocolate but you do you have to figure them out it, it's that kind of game where you yeah. figure out which one's the best ones Got unpleasant surprises <laughs> absolutely um so yeah welcome greg welcome to the game dev london podcast uh now for for those who don't know greg greg is a accomplished established well-known writer author uh, an all-round good guy uh, and today he joins us to have a chat about narrative in video games um, but before we sort of deep dive into that can you give us a bit a little bit more about yourself Greg? Sure um, so um, I got into game writing in my kind of mid-20s um, after sort of pursuing an entirely kind of academic path looking at um, novels and eventually video games so I sort of just um, a lot of people said I was very original in the kind of stuff I was covering in my PhD but it was sort of just a whatever I sort of was enjoying at the time with some kind of loose argument to justify me talking about all those things I was enjoying. So I sort of compared like Cormac McCarthy's The Road and Bioshock and like lots of different things and kind of strange combinations, but there were common connections to be made. So that was hopefully why it did well. Um, so um, after doing that, I transitioned into game writing. Um, so I was in Guildford and I ended up going to a, um, a game jam, first of a game jam. Um, and sort of blagged my way in as like, oh, I write, I write, um, even though I hadn't done anything before because it was a game jam. So it's, you know, who's going to sue me for saying I could write in such a scenario? Uh, but it ends up going well. And I was I was teamed with the um, uh, the Lionhead team there because they wanted someone who could do a wow. story and no one else wanted a story. So that was like a really nice introduction to the industry of, of meeting people. They shut down very shortly afterwards, hopefully no connection to sort of like <laughs> meeting them. Um, and um, uh, but yeah, after that, I sort of did my own indie games. So I did my own indie political games uh, around the time of Brexit and Trump's election. Um, and due to that and uh, kind of meeting people and sort of doing my own kind of portfolio examples, um, I ended up working for places like Supermassive Games um, and eventually uh, most well known for working for Hello Games um, on their No Man's Sky story updates. So um, as of uh, the second story, uh, update, Pathfinder, where they added vehicles to the game, I wrote a quest line for that that sort of presented, I think it presented the first moral choice that the game ever had, but sort of stuck in the middle of a driving tutorial. Um, so I sort of, I was being quite extra with the assignment of what <laughs> I was trying to do. Um, and um, uh, they then, I then stayed. So it was supposed to be a three week assignment turned into sort of a seven month assignment to work on um, a big new 30 hour campaign for the game that sort of um, overhauled some of the existing systems and materials, um, uh, kept some and added a lot. Um, and then after that, um, I sort of on off worked for them for several years afterwards. So most recently, even last summer, I'm um, doing the occasional bit of story content. Um, and I've also worked for uh, over 20 uh, AAA and indie games since, wow. um, including stuff for Alexa, um, stuff for VR. Um, I also did some additional writing for Metro Exodus uh, more recently. Um, and yeah, so I, 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 I uh, work on video games. Um, I also release uh, some of my own comics online um, and work on a, a project that's not announced yet. And um, uh, at the, currently, I'm doing. Uh, I'm about to release my first novel, um, which is coming out on 29th of April um, in the UK, uh, called 16 Horses. It's a kind of uh, a thriller novel about the discovery of 16 horse heads buried in circles on a farm near the sea, uh, and the ensuing investigation. And kind of, it's got horror elements to it. Um, and yeah, um, and I believe when this podcast is being launched today, um, I will have released a short interactive excerpt uh, from the uh, novel um, in a kind of twine interactive game format online, which I haven't really seen done for many novels before and was quite a kind of fun challenge. So um, I'm, yeah, I do lots of different uh, things um, and quite like uh, mixing up the boundaries between books and, and games uh, sort of from the very beginning up till recently. 
Yeah, absolutely. We'll be linking to the uh, your uh, teaching today uh, in the description so that if people want to go check that out, and, you know, learn more about the things that we've been talking about today, then they can go check that out and just see your see your writing in action quite literally. Yeah. Um, so that be so that'd be good fun. So if you want to if you want to pause right here, go check that out and then come back. Feel free. I'll wait. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, welcome back. Let's let's talk some more about narratives. It's interesting, particularly one of the things you pointed out there is that. So obviously, so where I come from, so I, I'm not a writer. I'm a you know I'm a programmer, and coming into games normally, um, right at the beginning, you know, I'm really focused on mechanics and that kind of thing. And you seem to, you seem to suggest in a couple of places, um, it's been something that people think of, you know, either late on in production or in some cases like with No Man's Sky after the game has come out. Do you find mm. that it changes how the narrative comes across depending on whether it's something that was entwined from the very beginning or something that was brought in later on or that it can work in both ways but in different ways? I think it can work in, in, in both ways. I, I think a lot of it's about execution and a lot of it's about how, how the studio approaches it. Um, so whenever I um, have been brought on to work on a story either post-release or um, when a story sort of sometimes even pre-release, but story hasn't been a big element there near the end. So it's, it's sort of equivalent to adding a story after the game because you sort of, I mean, in one case I had sort of, um, I think two weeks um, and the cutscenes in the game existed, everything in the game existed, but little there were, all I was allowed <laughs> to do was change the words they was gonna say and the lip syncing would be altered, but that was it because it was quite a minimalist art style. So, wow. um, so uh, I've been in quite a lot of different situations. Um, I often, partly because it's easier and it gives an, uh, kind of um an easy kind of starting point and something to kind of bounce off of i try and almost canonize in my head at least if not in the game the old version of the story so whatever was happening in the game right whatever it was before doing something relating to that um so i really liked uh, a, a big inspiration for this kind of thing and in a lot of projects i've worked on is how um you know e even if, as i said i, I was writing pre-release uh was um final fantasy 14 um and what happened with the relaunch for that game mm. um so you know infamously it launched in a kind of state where a lot of people um you know there were a lot of good systems a lot of stuff people were enjoying but there were a lot of complaints and i think square enix themselves weren't happy with how it was working and so on um and then when they um released their new uh the new version of realm reborn um they had a big kind of run-up quest where they sort of made the fact that the game was about to change part of the storyline um and in the new changed story which would stand on its own merits either way the old stuff is still part of it Mm. Um, and I, I find a lot of what I like about narrative and what I think a lot of players and, and readers respond to is texture and feeling like there's a lot of kind of things about the story that, that exist, but you're not being shown. Um, and okay. I feel like the kind of wonderful thing and weird thing about game development and having those kind of almost sedimentary layers of different vertical slices and different approaches to the game and stuff is you can sort of use that as a writer as if it's background law almost um and, and and have it be part of the the game um and so i think um i think if i'm uh, if a story is, uh that i'm working on is there from the beginning as opposed to being added later on um i think is this all still answering your question as well i'm not entirely sure but <laughs> yeah no, yeah, all good all rough, good rough, it's in the area it's all between your question anyway <laughs> um is that i think if i'm working on it from the very beginning um i still try and like the idea of bouncing off of stuff is still quite important mm. um but what i i mean what i will tend to do is I mean, it's been very rare that I've worked on a game that hasn't had some kind of gameplay demo or or kind of prototype in place okay. when they brought me on. Like, I I feel like it's rarely ever happened, um, unless it's an entirely narrative based game, in which case it might not. Um, and what I try and do is I'll try and play through as much as I can, uh, or even reference points to the game. So if they've got a lot of strong reference points, playing through those, think about how the gameplay makes me feel and how all the other elements make me feel, what those emotions are, and then using those emotions as the starting point for the story, um, because that in many ways will work even better for players i find than just purely um trying to kind of you know i, I there's a the, there's a phrase um that some of the audience may have heard of some not called ludo narrative dissonance which is when a story and a game don't fit together um but i think that's often taken a bit literally as in that like every single piece of story has to relate to like a gameplay device and it has to all really tie together and there's be no aberrations at all i, I feel like if it emotionally coheres with what the experience feels like to play and what the story feels like to enjoy they can be quite different and even dissonant by like other metrics but mm. it, it will be resonant i guess on an emotional level which i think is more important um and so that's what i sort of try and and i think that's partly why it's important to me to kind of take into account what's come before whenever i'm working on a project that's already in progress because um that context is going to be there for people 
either the people you're working for who are going to sort of be like deciding whether to accept the story you're giving them or not like that's you know they have in mind what it was you can't just ignore what it was but also players if, if you're writing for a game that already exists um they will have something in their minds as to how it all works um and so taking that into account making it a virtue rather than a problem um i think is is a is a is a fun thing about this medium in particular. So kind of almost thinking of a patch as a story device, um, or, or as, as, a, as a way of telling a story is is a is really interesting to me and something you can't really do in other media um, as well.